us there to the land of Zion next year in Jerusalem. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. Good evening. I'm Daniel Woodhead. I'm a Bible teacher for this show as we go through the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now this prophecy has been called the Gog and the Magog prophecy. And uh, it's an interesting prophecy because it has so much relevance to what's taking place today in that region of the world. This prophecy describes an allied invasion of Israel from the north and uh, the subsequent total destruction of the coalition of invading forces once they reach what are called the mountains of Israel. It appears that there's a preemptive uh, attack by the Israelis with nuclear weapons that results in a seven-year cleanup period. Now, it's first necessary in this prophecy to look at all the details of uh, the uh, invasion in order to accurately decipher these passages. You know, they've, uh, they've had particular relevancy to uh, times in the past, but nothing like the 21st century. My goodness, we see Russia invading eastern Ukraine and the Crimea. We see the Syrians having massive wars, hundreds of thousands, at least a hundred, minimum 100,000 dead over there. Uh, we see the Islamic countries uh, trying to attack the Israelis from the Gaza Strip and from Lebanon uh, and Syria, as I said, over the Golan Heights. And we also see the new group ISIS or ISIL that seems to have been born out of Al-Qaeda that is attempting to establish a new caliphate. But let's look at the prophecy here. I'm going to read two sections of the scripture in our show this evening. The first is what we looked at last time as a refresher, Ezekiel 38 verses 1 to 6. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face towards Gog, of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn thee about, and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine armies, horses, and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them handling swords, Persia, Cush, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, and all his hordes, the house of Togarma, in the uttermost parts of the north, and all his hordes, even many peoples with thee. At the beginning of this prophecy, we see Ezekiel, the prophet, receiving a prophecy from the God of the universe, and he's told to set his face against Gog in the land of Magog, and that he's the chief prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Ezekiel, as we've mentioned in previous sessions, uh, was carted away to Babylon in 597 B.C. by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar, and sometime between them in 586 B.C., he received this prophecy. Now, this representative, Ezekiel, of God, is in direct opposition to the man Gog and his goals. Beginning of this section of scripture, the focus is on one person, G-O-G, -G, Gog, the leader of the land of Magog. And he's further described as a prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Gog is not a name, but it's a title, very, very much like King, Kaiser, or Tsar. And uh, the identified person who's going to be leading this alliance is Ezekiel's Gog at the time of the invasion. Now, we don't know who that is. In our last session, I mentioned that uh, some have referred to uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, a notorious Russian Jew hater, 
as the one who would be Gog. Uh, Zhirinovsky was a, an, an ultra-Russian nationalist. He has been uh, attempting to become president for at least four times. In uh, the December 1993 elections, he was election to the, elected to the Russian parliament. He's a liberal Democrat uh, by the terms there, but he received, in 1993, he received 25% of the vote. Now, the party, the Liberal Democratic Party in Russia has been, uh, compared to Hitler's Nazi party, uh, Liberal Democrat in Russia is an entirely different political influence than what we're accustomed to in the United States. Some call these folks ultra-nationalist. Anyway, this kind of ultra-nationalism has, has or also na nationalism, it's got, it's got his, his avowed goal of ethnic, racial, or religious purity and ethnic cleansing. Uh, Zhirinovsky has written extensively on the future war that Russia must engage in with the people to the south. He wrote a, an autobiography that was called Last Dash to the South. It discusses Russia's fate of attacking the Mediterranean people in Russia's last great war. You know, he, just like Hitler, is claiming that the Jews are infecting the nation and they were responsible for World War I and II. It's ridiculous, but that's what he's saying. He says, uh, in order to understand the people and the countries involved, I say it's important to know who they are. What makes this prophecy so interesting, as other prophecies in the Bible, is that when God puts down, and I'm saying G-O-D now, when he puts down names in the Bible related to um, people groups, the countries he refers to are actually the ancient names for the people groups. Now we've got eight names here. We've got Magog, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Persia, Put, Gomer, and Togarma. In order to understand who these are, we have to look back to Genesis in order to see who these people groups are. See, God is referring to somebody here, and who they were in ancient times is who they are now, but with different names. So, the ancient scriptures, back to Genesis, have given us genealogies. When Noah, his wife, and their three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, along with their wives, left the ark after it landed on Ararat, after the worldwide flood, they began to migrate to different nations. I'm going to put a map up here for you to take a look at in a moment, and you can see the area of the migration in this map. The uh, Japheths, uh, Japhethites, if you will, went north, and it's a pink area in this ancient map. The Hamites went to the uh, south and to the uh, west, and the Shemites stayed in uh, the Middle East and went slightly south and slightly east. But it's important for our purposes here to see where the Japhethites went. So, let's, uh, let's take a look at um, the map. And uh, also, it's important that we consider um, that these names were tribes. They, be, they were individuals, then they became tribes, and then countries. So, the um, name uh, that's associated with Magog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, comes from Japheth's progeny, and that's who populated the ancient world in the areas of modern-day Russia, uh, as well as Turkey and the Russian steppes. The three sons of Noah all went in different directions. So, uh, the map that we just looked at clearly demonstrates the migration pattern of these sons. Now, <clears throat> God highlighted Turkey and southern Russia to demonstrate where these invaders 
to the north would come from. And this is fully described in the book of Genesis. The geographic region where the invasion is going to come from allows us to see how these coalition forces are going to organize around this man whose title is Gog from the north. And they're compromised of the nations that exerted the worst Jewish persecutions that have ever occurred, specifically those that came from Russia, Germany, and the Muslim nations. Now, from Genesis chapter 10, we can see who the sons of Noah are, and in particular, the, uh, the one son, Japheth, and we can see where he migrated. Now, I've got a chart up for you to take a look at of the genealogy of Noah, and we can see Japheth is highlighted there in red, and these are the sons and grandsons that he gave birth to, or his wife did, and you can see in blue the names of the particular individuals that are going to participate in this invasion, and they all come from the north. So you got to look back to Genesis 10, and then you can see who these are, as well as their position around Israel, as you can see in this particular map that I've got up now. Israel and the surrounding invading nations. And it's interesting to see how the Old Testament will give us these names, but then put those in perspective here. So the identification of Magog, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal is determined from Japheth's progeny that populated the ancient uh, world in area of modern-day Russia. Magog, Meshach, and Tubal were located between the Black and the Caspian Seas, which today is southern Russia. It also included part of Iran and Turkey. Now, according to some, the tribes of Meshach and Tubal later gave names to cities that today bear the names of Moscow, the capital, and Toblusk. It's a major city in the Urals in Siberia. Anyway, Rosh was in what is now northern Russia. The name Rosh is the basis for the modern name Russia. It also means head or top in, uh, in Hebrew. These names then cover the modern territories of uh, northern and southern Russia and Europe and Siberia and to the east and Asia. The modern nation of Russia encompasses all the nations of Ezekiel. And uh, if there was any possible doubt, the, the sixth verse in that passage I just read there says that all these come from the uttermost parts of the north, Siberia. Now this is repeated in uh, Ezekiel 38.15 and 39.2 that we'll be reading over these next few weeks. So from Israel, the uttermost part of the north is Russia, with Moscow being almost a straight line due north from Jerusalem. Therefore, Russia is the leader of the northern confederacy, with Gog as the leader of Russia. This has also been the rabbinic view. Now I've got a commentary that I'm going to quote from here by a rabbi, Moish Eisenman. And uh, in his commentary on Ezekiel, he states that Geonim, which is a, a school of rabbis, ancient school of rabbis, had a tradition that these controls, or who's going to do something, were indeed located in Russia. One tradition passed down from the Vilna Geon states, when the Russian navy passed through the Bosphorus on the way to the Dardanelles, it will be time to put on Sabbath clothes in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. So, in this Gog and Magog war, Messiah, the son of Joseph, will be killed, which will then bring the coming of the Messiah, the son of David. You know, what's very, very interesting is the Jews have been looking for a Messiah, <clears throat> and they knew that they thought there were two Messiahs, and one uh, would be the son of Joseph, and he is going to be killed. And the other is going to be the son of David, and he's not. He's going to be conquering and coming to set up his kingdom. Well, that's what Jesus claimed to be. He claimed to be the son of Joseph, which he sort of was. He was uh, <clears throat> raised by Joseph and Mary, and he did get killed, didn't he? Just like uh, Daniel 9 says that the Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And then the book of Revelation in the New Testament shows us that he's coming back to set up his kingdom. 
So it's interesting. Uh, Russia is not alone in the invasion of Israel. She's part of a coalition or confederacy, if you will. And the other nations are listed in verses 5 to 6. One of them is Persia, which is now present-day Iran. It used to be called Persia as much as this 30, 40 years ago. Once, Iran was generally a pro-Western and a pro-Israel country. But after the Khomeini Revolution in the late 70s, it became anti-Western and anti-Israel. And it's more within the Russian sphere of influence than it is the Western sphere. My goodness, uh, maybe some of us can remember that uh, they actually, in Iran, in Tehran, they uh, captured people from our embassy and held them for, seems like, over a year. Now, there's another nation here that's involved. It's called Cush. And in the Bible, there's two places that have that name. One is in Mesopotamia. It's Genesis 2, 13. But all the other usages refer to Ethiopia. So looking at current events and <clears throat> seeing how this is referred to now, it's tempting to identify it with Mesopotamia. Um, you know, the Mesopotamian countries, at least of Syria and Iraq. But consistent with the, year to, the use of the word Cush everywhere else in Scripture, I think it's important to identify it with Ethiopia because we can't use the current events and we can't use some of the other obscure references to Cush. Uh, it's used most often as uh, Ethiopia. Another one is called Put, and uh, that's not Libya. Uh, if it was, it would be Lub, for example. <clears throat> But uh, Somaliland, or Somalia, because that borders Ethiopia, and it's followed by Gomer, located in the present-day Germany. You know, the, 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 the rabbis thought that Gomer was also Germany, because the Talmud refers to Gomer as Germany. Now, the last name is Togarma. That's present-day Armenia. Verse 6 adds... The phrase, even many peoples with you. So this phrase is probably simply defining the numbers of the nations already mentioned. But it may include some others that aren't mentioned. But in all probability, it's the former that's meant. And now in the answer to who is involved in this confederacy, it's Russia, and the allied states of Iran, Ethiopia, Somalia, Germany, and Armenia. And these nations are located geographically north and south of Israel. But the controlling nation is Russia. The invasion comes from the north. You know, these names have changed over the centuries, as I mentioned, Persia to Iran. And they may change again, but the geography stays the same. And the motives stay the same. Regardless of what names they may carry at the time of the invasion, it's these very geographical regions that are involved. Now, um, an Orthodox Jewish commentary, as I mentioned, written by Rabbi Moshe Eisenman, he makes this observation. Look what he says here. Yerushalayim Magila Shalosh Arba renders Magog as Gutia or Guta. The Goths, a group of nomadic tribes who destroyed the Scythians and made their home in the Scythian territory. And it goes through uh, three, four, as I said, to three, nine, actually. <clears throat> Considering the Goths were a Germanic people, he says, the identification of Magog's descendants as the Goths in accordance with Targum Yonasan to Genesis 10, 2, which renders Magog as Germania, which in the Bereshit Rabbah 37, 1 is given as Germania. So the Targum Yonasan is another Jewish writing, and the Bereshit Rabbah is a Jewish commentary on Genesis. So as we saw in our first session, <clears throat> the persecutions that have come, especially from the Russians, is about ready to be, uh, God's ready to get his vengeance, <laughs> about ready to be ended. With this invasion, it's going to precipitate God's judgment on Russia, but it's God who's in control. 
It is he who's bringing the invasion about. You know, you can see the sovereignty of God in this invasion. This is the means by which Russia will be punished for her long history of Jewish persecution. I I'm going to move on with the text and look at a couple more verses here. Ezekiel 38, verses 7 to 9. Be thou prepared. Prepare thyself, thou and all thy companies that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples, upon the mountains of Israel which have been a continual waste. But it is brought forth out of the peoples, and they shall dwell securely, all of them, and thou shalt ascend, thou shalt come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy hordes, and many peoples with thee. So here's another section that discusses the concept as to where the invasion is going to take place. So the passage addresses Gog as the leader of the confederacy, and then in the next verse it's given the specific place where this invasion is going to take place. And it's stated to be the land of Israel. And more specifically, it's the mountains of Israel. So verse 9 describes this massive invasion. And it pictures it like a storm cloud that's covering the entire land. This is another passage that shows the necessity of the establishment of the Jewish state um, in order for this to happen. And it also demonstrates the gathering is in unbelief. You see that from Ezekiel chapter 20. Now Israel had to be a state again before this invasion can occur. And furthermore, Israel's gathered in unbelief since after the invasion occurs, many in Israel turn to the Lord. Verse 8 describes the Jewish state as being first, a land brought back from the sword, Second, a land that is gathered out of many peoples. And third, a land with mountains that have been continual waste. And fourth, a land that's brought forth out of the peoples. Ezekiel is not describing an Israel that ever existed in ancient times. But all these statements are true of modern day Israel. This began occurring near the end of the 19th century, and it culminated with statehood in 1948. Now, since then, the waste places have been rebuilt and resettled on a more massive scale. Specifically, it's referring to something called the latter days, or the last days, or the end times, if you will, in biblical eschatology. Lord Jesus gave us information necessary to understand what the last days was and how that timing works out. In his Olivet Discourse, he told the inner circle, the Jewish apostles, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, who were asking questions about him when the last days would occur. Now, he talked about a variety of things with them, but he said specifically for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes, and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So according to all three gospel writers, the sign of the end of the age is said to be when nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. It's going to be coupled with famines, and earthquakes, in various places, and then Jesus clearly stated, this is the beginning of travail, of sorrows. And uh, he's using a woman's pregnancy and delivery with, uh, you know, as an illustration here. The birth pang or travail is referred to a series of birth pangs that a woman undergoes before giving birth to a, an infant. They come with greater intensity and greater frequency up to the birth. And he's referring now, though, to the birth of the Messianic Age. We call the Millennial Kingdom because uh, it, it will last a thousand years. Now the beginning of travail, the first birth pang, and the sign that the end of the age had begun is when nation 
rises against nation and kingdom against kingdom. In order to understand this, it's important to see how the Bible uses those two passages. I'm going to refer to a couple different passages, and you can see how it's used. For example, Isaiah 19, 1-4. The text there says, The burden of Egypt, behold, Jehovah rideth upon a swift cloud and cometh into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall tremble at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it, and I will stir up the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother, and every one against his neighbor, <clears throat> city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. And the spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst of it, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek unto idols, and to charmers, and them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards, and I will give over the Egyptians into the land of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord Jehovah of hosts. Now, in this passage, you got the land of Egypt in view, and the idiom, it points to a conflict over the whole land of Egypt, as the nation is just massively engrossed in civil war. <clears throat> Now the one is in Second Chronicles 15, 1 to 7. And the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and saith unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Jehovah is with you, while ye are with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season, <clears throat> Israel would, without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. But when in their distress they turned unto Jehovah, the God of Israel, and sought him, he was found of them. And in those times there was no peace to him that went out nor him that came in. But great vexations were upon the inhabitants of the lands, and they were broken in pieces, nation against nation, and city against city, for God did vex them with all adversity. But ye be strong, and let not your hands be slack, for your work shall be rewarded. Now these passages refer to the Middle East, and the idiom is saying, when the conflict is in the whole Middle East. Now, the Olivet Discourse <clears throat> is talking about the whole world. So, World War I and World War II were the beginning of the end times. God bless you. I'm going to leave you today, and I will come back next week, and I will continue this explanation and move on with this prophecy. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 48 Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877-706-2479. That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.
Take us there, take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hero Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there. 